Yeah. Famous last words. Yeah. So it's really nice to be here today. Thank you all for coming on a beautiful, this beautiful drive over, a beautiful almost fall day here. Um, my name is Jennifer Dunn, and I'm a PhD candidate at Montana State in the History Department. That's how I know Kim um, from her work in the MA program as well. So we've gotten to know each other well. Uh, and have had a few beers. <laughs> um, so today I'm here to talk a little about my research, um, which is um, on Superfund communities. I say Superfund, the joke will not be as funny here for you all living in Butte, but I say I tell people I'm doing work on Superfund communities, and they say, Superfund, and I'm like, ooh. <laughs> so not a lot of people know about super fun communities, but they should because they're um, pervasive across the nation and impact a lot of people, you know, you, Libby being two places in Montana. Um, so I uh, grew up in Bozeman, um, but I have connections to Butte. Uh, my in-laws are right over there, way right <laughs> <laughs> over there. And my husband was the um, extension agent here. Gosh, about 10 years ago, maybe, Toby Day, for oh, him. Yeah. He was a horticulture specialist here. So um, definitely have some ties to Butte and have come over and done research. My big sort of scandalous announcement now is as I move forward with my project, I think I'm actually going to focus specifically on Libby. I don't mean to leave Butte out of the loop, but Libby just has a lot going on right now, which we'll talk about uh, with it going off the um, EPA list and the changes that are occurring there. So, but I've really enjoyed looking at you as well too. So, go ahead and get started. And um, please, if you have any questions, um, I have a lot to cover, but if you could write them down or save them to the end, I'm more than happy to talk with you when we're done. So, we're gonna start here, which is neither Butte or Libby. Um, this might look familiar to some of you. On August 5th, 2015, <laughs> a 20 foot high wave of orange sludge came pouring down the Animas River, just located in southwestern Colorado, alarming communities in four states, sort of the border states there. The cause of this toxic water, which is over there, um, was um, caused uh, at least initially by some EPA staff who were trying to shore up some discharges that were in local. Um, mines, abandoned mines, and sort of dislodged some rocks, and it allowed this sludge to come pouring down the, um, into the Animus River. Um, it came out of the Gold King Mine, which is an abandoned mine near Silverton, Colorado. That's the local community. And it's a community of about 600 in the San Juan Mountains. Okay. Um, the accidental spill released 3 million gallons of contaminated water. Um, containing iron, aluminum, magnesium, lead, zinc, copper, and many other rip metals into the Animus River, like I said, which is a popular area for whitewater rafting and fishing. It's a big recreational area in the San Juan Mountains. Um, people locally, not very happy with the EPA. Saw the EPA to blame. You can see some responses here. Um, very um, angry at the spill and the ramifications from that spill. Uh, and the reaction was swift. This sort of stuff spread across social media. It was in the news. That's why so many people remember sort of this Orange River. Uh, it was very, like a very big um, event uh, that came out in that August. However, um, although the reaction was swift and spread quickly, the damage it caused was fairly limited um, and short-lived. The river was open to recreational users within 10 days. And you can see here the fear was that that um, orange sludge would go all the way down into Lake Powell and affect the water supply there. It actually made it to about the Four Corners area, about 100 miles from Silverton, and it became diluted before it got that far. So the, the fears, particularly with the um, Native American reservations um, there in Utah and Arizona, uh, didn't quite make it that far. So while that scope was relatively limited. Um, I think this accident illuminates a larger story of the mining industry's impacts on the American West since the mid-1800s. So while an EPA staff member who has always been unnamed, they've never released that information, did knock the rocks that started that spill, um, 
and in, from the mine tunnel. It would have never happened if not for the extensive and intensive mining that took place in that, that area for over 100 years. There would not have been that, that wastewater there. So my goal today is to talk a little about the ramifications um, in the American West from a century, over a century of mining. And Silverton's relatively recent and very visible experience with toxic waste highlights how communities on the local scale as well as the federal government are choosing to deal with over 100 years of industrialization and resource extraction and the subsequent legacies to our environment and our health. I'm interested in studying the relationships between industrialization, degraded lands, economically challenged communities, and the federal government to see how super fun communities like you and Libby um, have reinvent themselves for the 21st century. Um, today, so today I'm interested in presenting on sort of the historical um, conditions of industrialization and its legacy um, that led to the creation of the Superfund program. Um, the goals of the Superfund program um, across the board, particularly in Butte and Libby, and then sort of end with the future of toxic places and how reclamation and remediation um, occur as they deal with uncertain environments and uncertain economic futures in these communities. So this presentation is going to explore the effects of industrialization on the environment and our bodies and our attempts to mitigate these effects through um, technology. So we'll start a little quick history lesson, bear with me. Um, industrialization in America really started in the mid 19th century, um, the most common area people know about is Lowell, Massachusetts with the textile mills starting there. However, starts and quickly spreads um, throughout the new nation. By the early 20th century, America is the world's leading um, industrial nation. And we have a lot of natural resources to contribute to that. Coal, oil, which was discovered in Pennsylvania in 1859, timber, iron, water, those, all of those resources fuel industrial growth. And in addition to sort of having all these um, resources to fuel industrial growth, we start to feel the need to move people and goods across the nation. People are heading west after the Civil War. Um, you have railroads and steamboats moving people and resources um, to this area of extremely abundant resources that you see out west. And um, this view of science and technology being ex um, applied to extract those resources and create new materials as well come with benefits and costs that we still see today. Um, so the role of industrialization led to America becoming an imperial superpower. Um, we saw a lot of changes during this early industrial period, creation of an electrical grid, um, improvements in transportation and communication, the urbanization of America as rural people move to cities for jobs, um, a rise in population, and generally a rise in economic wealth. However, um, as we all know, that was very unevenly distributed. We had, you know, Clark and Daly benefiting from this industrialization in the West. But generally, American wealth overall did rise to some degree for everyone. Um, and during this early industrial time period and the booming of the industrial time period, uh, the negative effects of industrialization were really considered the cost of progress. You can't get ahead um, unless you industrialize, and there might be some negative effects, but that's necessary for industrialization to occur. occur. Um, there were some early conservation movements um, that focused on nature and the effects of industrialization in nature. And of course, um, particularly you see in Butte and other places in the West, the rise of, um, or the focus on industrialization and workers and how that affected workers' lives and what that mean for them. So the rise of unions, um, focus on protection of workers comes out of this industrial period. Um, but you don't see a huge focus on the environmental effects across the board of industrialization until um, after World War II, right around World War II. And I'll, there's a couple different reasons for this. One is, and I'll talk about this, we have a number of events that occur in the post-war years that really highlight the effects, um, the negative effects of industrialization on the environment. Um, we have new forms of air and water pollution that have not been seen um, come out in the post-war years. 
haven't seen those ramifications, and new chemicals and materials being developed to impact how we see pollution. We have nuclear waste, waste and chemical toxins that didn't present concerns to us in the early 20th century. Um, and how do those affect human health and the environment? This also pairs with the rising environmental movement that you see coming out of the post-war years as well. Um, as I said, uh, there are a number of environmental disasters that occur that bring attention to envir the environmental movement and environmental concerns during this time. And historian Samuel Hayes, um, who wrote a big book on conservation and um, environmentalism in the United States, says that prior to 1950, more focus was on conservation and efficient use of the environment, tended to be how people focused on the environment. However, after World War II, there was a shift to appreciating environments only if left in their quote unquote natural conditions. In conjunction to this search for pristine nature, a search for improved health and well-being came along with that. And you can really see that in the 1962 publication of Silent Spring by Rachel Carson, which documents the adverse effects of the environment um, through pesticides and this idea that new chemicals are affecting the environment in new ways and can lead to effects on human health. So, a couple brief, fun little environmental disasters to mention here. We have the first is Denora, Pennsylvania, which is a steel town. This picture was taken um, in October um, in 1948 at noon. And what happened there? was that um, there was a steel plant, an aluminum plant there, and it would have these inversions from the um, smog being released from the plant. And due to a combination of weather and other events, they had five days of impacted smog on Denora, Pennsylvania, um, which led to 20 immediate deaths. Oh and the smog was so thick at times that football players on the field on the game couldn't be seen by the crowd wow. because it was so thick. Um, nearly half the town's population of 14,000 became ill and went to nearby hospitals. Um, as I said, 20 people died during those five days of the inversion, but after the inversion lifted, another 50 people died connected to the smog that came out of that. This really was one of the turning points in how people viewed air pollution. Instead of something that might have been seen as a nuisance before or as a necessary product of having smelters and things like that, now suddenly air pollution is seen as something that can be deadly to humans and very toxic. The next one to go? Okay. This is the Cuyahoga River in Ohio. Um, this was called the most polluted river in America. In Kent State, a university in Ohio, did a report um, in the 1960s that noted that large quantities of heavy black oil floated on the river, sometimes several inches thick and that animal life did not exist in the river for um, many, many miles. Over time, from the late 1800s until um, 1969 about, there were 13 fires reported on the river. This picture is actually from a 1952 fire from oil and industrial um, waste. The 1969 fire, it's hard to track down any pictures of it, but that, really, um, that fire really spurred this idea that water pollution was dangerous and toxic. When, when um, rivers can catch on fire, you might have a problem going on there. And this uh, focus on needing to clean up the water um, environment. And the last one I want to talk about quickly is Love Canal in the er Love Canal, New York. In the early 1900s, a chemical company um, buried 22,000 tons of toxic waste in an area of um, Niagara Falls, New York. So this is Love Canal, if you don't know, is sort of a, an area of Niagara Falls. And eventually, over time, housing and a school were built on top of the waste dump. In the 1970s, residents began reporting health problems and chemical waste began to appear on top of the soil. They also reported a high percentage of birth defects in households there. Love Canal became a national media event and President Carter declared Love Canal a disaster site and ordered an emergency evacuation of residents. So these are just three of many um, sort of post-World War II environmental disasters that occurred that led to the creation of the EPA and the Superfund program. So um, these legacies of mining and industry, um, chemical use, um, different um, pollution sources, along with the growing environmental movement, encouraged an understanding that human and environmental health 
needed to be protected and remediated from the damages of pollution. This led to the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency in 1970 and the Superfund program in 1980. The Superfund program um, is actually called the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, or CERCLA, up there, but we most commonly know it as Superfund. And it's designed to fund the cleanup of sites contaminated with hazardous substances and pollutants. The goal is to protect human health and the environment by managing the cleanup of the nation's most hazardous waste sites. Um, these sites compose um, a variety of health and environmental hazards from mining waste, industrial and chemical waste, water pollution, air pollution. Um, there are many sites that the EPA follows. They are tracking more than 530,000 sites in nearly 23 million acres nationwide. That's the size of Indiana, to give you a scope for that. And obviously, with that kind of um, vast amount of um, area, the EPA uh, has to prioritize what areas will be cleaned first. They have to prioritize the most hazardous waste areas. So they created a system, the NPL, the National Priorities List, um, that are considered the most contaminated and dangerous waste sites. There are over, have been over 1,700 sites on the NPL, the National Priorities List, those most dangerous um, sites that need to be cleaned up. Um, since the beginning of Superfund legislation, a little less than 400 have been cleaned up and removed from the NPL list. So I hope you can see it on here, but the red sites are um, currently on the NPL, the yellow sites are proposed, and the green have been deleted from the NPL. Usually that means cleanup has been done, not always, but usually that means cleanup has been done. This is a massive governmental program that affects, as you can see, all states, dense urban areas to remote rural settings. A 2015 EPA study of about 1,400 Superfund sites found that 53 million people, or about 17% of the US population, live within three miles of a Superfund site. Many Superfund sites are located in communities that are minority, low income, <coughs> linguistically isolated, and have less than a high school education than the rest of the US population as a whole. The EPA does caution against assuming that living near a site represents a higher level of health risk, but Superfund sites, particularly abandoned industrial sites, um, landfills and military depots, have been linked to higher cancer risks. That little picture down there um, is the Montana Department of Environmental Quality map of federal Superfund sites, um, and those that are not on the NPL yet but are under construction, um, there are currently 17 Montana Superfund sites on the NPL. So you can see it's a massive program affecting, as I said, 17% um, of the US population living within three miles of a Superfund site. If you live here, you live within three miles. If you live in Bozeman, you live within three miles of a Superfund site as well, too. Um, the one, there's one out on North 7th um, from the Idaho coal plant is a Superfund site that they're in the process of taking off. So, how are we going to pay for this massive cleanup of sites across the nation? Um, so, initially, the Superfund Enforcement Program was designed to have the cleanup done by finding companies or people responsible for site contamination and negotiating with them to do cleanup themselves or to pay to have it done. Those are the PRP, potentially responsible parties. If they can't or won't pay or can't be tracked down, the EPA can pursue through federal court um, systems with the Department of Justice to get them to pay. Um, when the program, Superfund program was established in 1980, the goal was to hold companies and industry responsible for the waste, accountable for the waste that they produced. And Congress also assessed petroleum, chemical, and corporate taxes to fund the program and expensive cleanups. Those taxes expired in 1995 and congressional funding has been drastically reduced since that time period. Now most of the funding comes through taxpayer dollars. For the past 20 years, congressional appropriations for Superfund have decreased from $2 billion to $1.1 billion. Um, the Washington Post published in 2017 that over the past 20 years, American, ta American taxpayers have spent more than $21 billion in cleanup and oversight costs for Superfund sites, while responsible companies have paid little, if any. So, Let's move on to a place near and dear, I'm sure, in your hearts, Butte, Montana. So some of this I'm sure you all know, but Butte at the turn of the last century was known as the biggest 
and wildest town between Minneapolis, Denver, and San Francisco. Um, the Gold Rush of Butte is really, um, as I'm sure you know, a small part of a larger historical event. Um, gold mining and other mining across the West takes home, hold um, after the Civil War, really is when the boom sort of occurs. Um, we see former, um, we see former residents from the South and the North move West to go into mining, and uh, miners filter into Montana and struggle with gold mining, you know, down in Virginia City and Alder City in that area. Um, the gold boom peaked in view early and was bust by 1879. Hard rock mining starts in the 1880s with a focus on silver, but soon the vast copper ore resources become apparent. Marcus Daly, a copper king, found the largest deposit of copper sulfide that the world had ever seen. And in August of 1885, the West Shore, a Pacific Coast promotional magazine, reckoned that, quote, the largest, busiest, and richest mining camp in the world today is Butte, Montana. Um, copper converges at its time with the industrialization of America, so the discovery of copper in Butte very fortuitously can help supply the world with copper as the nation is electrifying, as transportation systems um, are being spread across the nation, all of that as the country urbanizes. Um, you know, copper had been an important commodity since the Iron Age. This is not a new discovery of the uses of copper, but it really becomes part of this industrial world, and it becomes a global commodity in the 19th century, and its high conductivity made it essential to the rapid spread of electricity and electrical appliances across the nation. From 1883 until the 1980s, the United States led all other nations in copper production, and copper's usage exploded in the new age of electricity and industrialization, and really put Butte on the map as America's, North America's um, largest copper producer. Um, if you go into the archives, which I spent some time, proud Butte residents like to say during World War I, copper was in every single rifle bullet fired, and that all that copper came from Butte, Montana. Butte, Montana won the war. Um, the copper ore mined from Butte Mining District in 1910 alone totaled 284 million pounds at the time. Butte was the largest producer in copper and rivaled worldwide metal production only by South Africa. Um, these look familiar to you. Of course, it's not just Butte that is part of this industrial force. It spreads over into Anaconda and the Deer Lodge Valley, um, the Anaconda Smelter over there. And this, all of this production, mining, smelting of copper ore means that Butte becomes the richest hill on earth the moniker we all know it by. Um, through that process, it also becomes the largest Superfund site in the nation 100 years later. The legacy of air, soil, and water pollution. There we go. Um, as in many mining towns um, throughout the world and across the West, there's various, various ups and downs in the mining economy. And by the 1950s, hard rock mining in Butte was no longer economically viable. So they move from underground mining to strip mining, as you all know, instead of tunneling down, start to remove entire hillsides um, to create the Berkeley Pit, which started in 1955. Um, the pit took over large sections of uptown Butte neighborhoods, and instead of tunneling down into the earth, they start to remove the hillsides to get to the copper ore. And um, that happens for about 30 years, until that no longer becomes economically feasible, and ARCO turns off the pumps to the mines in Butte, and thousand miles, thousands of miles of underground tunnels start to fill with toxic water and pour into the pit. <coughs> I like this graphic here. I don't know why 1992 and 1995 are out of order. I don't know about that, but I still like this view of the growing pit, on um, the water in the pit. Over one billion tons of ore was mined from the pit in less than 30 years. As I said, in 1982, the pit was no longer producing enough economically viable copper, and so when they turned off those pumps, you can see it, slowly start to fill with water here throughout the years. There's an estimated 43 billion gallons of water in the pit, and rising with about 2.5 million gallons each day. I love this graphic here. Um, this shows that dark dip is the pit. Um, the red dots on the surface show um, mines on the surface and the shafts going down, and then the lines across show how vertically they went. So when you think about, um, I mean, 
less of a surprise to you all, but when I show this in other places, people are like, oh, because of the amount of mines that are underneath view, and explains as water fills up how it's pouring into that pit. I think it's a really nice graphic here um, that shows that. Um, there we go. Uh, other problems comes around when you have a huge pit filled with toxic water, acid, and heavy metals. Um, familiar to all of you, the snow geese incident in 1995, where almost 350 carcasses were removed from the pit. Um, they instituted a lot of deterrence to try and stop that from happening again. And you can see this picture's all small, but drones and guns and fireworks and cannons to try and keep um, that, that incident from happening again. It's a huge area though, uh, 450 acre surface of the water. And in 2016, 10,000 snow geese landed, and thousands are estimated to have died from landing on that pit. Um, Montana uh, Resources, a company which still mines the open pit mine that's operational in view, set up a bird hazing program um, since 1996. That 2016 die off of geese has sparked a renewed effort to come with a science-based approach to keep migratory waterfowl away. So as I said, drones, they remote control um, boats, Rifles, spot, uh, spotlights, fireworks, all sorts of things to try and keep that from happening again. But it's a huge area, as I said, a very um, challenging task. Rising waters from the pit are as a concern as they come closer to the critical level that threaten to flood the groundwater with toxins and heavy metals. Estimates say they will reach that critical level in about 2023. Um, this was a graphic that I took when I gave this presentation in the fall and the current water level is listed there. I looked it up on August 1st, the current water level of the pit was estimated at 5,355 feet and 26 inches. So it's risen since whenever this graphic was created. Um, Montana Resources again has submitted a plan to begin pumping and treating the Berkeley pit's toxic water. The goal is to slow down or ultimately halt the rising water of the pit. They want to start with 3 million gallons of water each day and treat it by taking the copper out of it, treat the um, water, and eventually move up to $7 million. The goal is to neutralize the water while we're treating the copper in it. As I said, they hope to recover 100,000 pounds of copper a month from the water. And I love this quote that was in the Montana Standard from an employee at, T at Montana Resources. And they say, for 30 years, we've watched the pit control the groundwater. It's time to show we can control the pit. And I think that's a standard line as you look through industrialization is we can control um, nature. And sometimes nature has a way of sneaking around that and proving us wrong on that. Um, so Montana Resources are operating ahead of schedule on their plans. The Superfund, um, as I mentioned, the largest Superfund site in the nation. Uh, the Butte legacy of mining and smelting in Butte and Anaconda um, is vast, as you know. And the environmental damage makes local policy, local technology, and local funding almost ineffective to deal with the waste that's there. And that is a common theme with Superfund sites. Oftentimes, local communities do not have the money um, to do the cleanup on their own. And we're going to come back to Silverton and sort of talk about that. But they do not have that. Oftentimes, it's economically depressed communities because the local industry is left or closed. And so um, that's where Superfund's goal as a federal program to come in and sort of be able to affect change through the money they have, that's where that comes from. Um, during a century of large-scale mining operations in Butte, over 500 underground mines operated on Butte Hill, and Anaconda had the smelter with multiple stacks discharging toxic smoke, um, particularly arsenic, which is a problem over in the Anaconda area. Um, head frames dot the landscape, but the Berkeley pit has become the largest physical reminder of Butte mining. The concerns of toxic waste in Butte and its threats to human health means that Butte was one of the earliest designated Superfund sites in the nation. The first batch of Superfund sites, Butte was in there. Um, Superfund came to the, um, Butte as a result of local health department workers running routine tests and finding arsenic in the water. And that causes multiple um, Superfund sites. So as you probably know from Uptown Butte down to basically Missoula, or Superfund, all part of, that's why it's such a vast area, all part of Superfund. Uh, anecdotally, in talking to people in view, I've heard that Superfund was not initially um, welcomed 
but EPA science reports came out showing the problems from particularly arsenic, and people quickly got on board generally with Superfund. More than 600 acres of land have been remediated and reclaimed. There's still arguments over aspects of the Superfund and what areas should be included in Superfund there. So, you can see Butte Superfund, um, very large uh, and a very long lasting Superfund site. So it's basically 1983. We're gonna switch gears and talk a little about Libby. How many of you have been to Libby before? Okay. Um, way up in the northwestern corner of the state. There we go. Um, I always forget. I always think like, well, I live in western Montana, I live in Bozeman. And I drove up there in May and I was like, oh my gosh, it's as long of a drive for me to drive from Bozeman to Libby as it is for me to drive from Bozeman to Sydney. Like, just a long way up there on small roads. It's a small census population, Lincoln County is the county. There's almost about 19,000 people in Lincoln County, which means that it qualifies for frontier status according to the federal government. Um, their heritage in Lincoln County and Libby is very dependent on natural resource extraction, predominantly mining and logging up there. Um, I love telling the story, particularly to people not from Montana, about how the school uh, mascot in, Link in Libby are the loggers. And so when the team comes on to play, they have chainsaws that the chains have been removed and they run, run, run when the team comes on to play. And people are like, where do you live? So, great. Um, gold and silver mining started in Libby in the 1860s, just like it did across the state. It's another example of that. And continued intermittently um, till the mid 20th century. There's a push to bring back gold and silver mines in Libby right now through Hecla. Um, but in 1919, what really set Libby's fortune is Libby resident E. N. Alley, who was a local resident there, owned the <laughs> local hotel, um, had sort of inherited a, a mine claim from a friend and was researching it. And he had a candle lit, and he noticed that when he touched it to the surface of the mine, these weird things would happen. And he eventually figured out that it was a new mineral, it was called vermiculite, and it would expand when it came in contact with heat. It's about, the mine's about six miles from Libby. Uh, vermiculite, as I said, it ex when it expands, it expands into a lightweight, non-flammable material when it's heated. Um, oftentimes it's called popped. They pop it um, to get it to that level. And then it is um, very corrosive resistance, um, heat resistant. It really is um, resistant to a lot of different effects that come onto it. He called it, Ali called it zonal light. And by the 1920s, the mine produced up to 100 tons a day of raw ore shipped across the nation. So about the 1920s is when the mine really started to take off. Libby has a different history with Superfund than Butte does. Both are mining histories that lead to toxic landscapes and environmental health problems. Um, vermiculite itself is not harmful to human health, but the problem with the vermiculite in Libby is that it's paired with a particularly um, virulent and dangerous form of asbestos called tremolite asbestos there. Many times asbestos, asbestos is not good, you all know that, you should know that across the board, but many times asbestos fibers are sort of curly Q and they can get into your lungs, it's not good. However, the ones in Libby are shaped like little arrows and they go straight into your um, lung tissue. It's very bad and it can cause lung diseases, asbestosis, lung cancer, mesothelioma, which you probably see uh, the ads on TV, that's a particular form of malignant cancer. Regardless of the diagnosis from lung disease, all three diseases share some common symptoms, shortness of breath, persistent cough, and chest pain, and the symptoms take decades to develop after initial exposure. So you don't see symptoms right away when people are exposed to asbestos. This uh, killed me when I found it, but one graphic description of the impact of asbestos on lungs describes how, quote, the tissue changes from the elasticity and thickness of a balloon to that of an orange peel, making it impossible to take a deep breath. So that's the impact mm. of particularly this type of asbestos. That's the mine there, that's vermiculite, what vermiculite looks like up there. Um, and this is sort of the mill processing area in Libby. In 18, sorry, 1963, W.R. Grace acquired the mine and continued to mine, mill, and distribute Libby vermiculite for almost 30 years. It's estimated that W.R. Grace processed nearly 200 thousand tons of vermiculite from the Libby mine each year until the fine mine finally ceased operations in 1990. Um, 
the process of, of getting uh, the vermiculite to that sort of pop stage is they have to mine it from the ground, then take it down to the mill and crush it. And in the crushing process and the mining process, it would release asbestos fibers. fibers. Then they would take it to the, the popping plant where they would heat it, and that would also re release asbestos, fire, asbestos fibers. So you have dust from the mine, which is about six miles away, coming down into Libby, and then you also have um, in Libby them processing and popping it, which is releasing um, dust throughout the community. In, um, when they would pop it to make it light and porous for insulation, they would store it at facilities to ship it across the nation. And so this is a picture of the baseball field in Libby, and that's the processing plant right there. Little pictures of that, the Grace Mill and Export Plant. Um, sometimes games, baseball games, have to be postponed because thick clouds of dust develop from the loading boxcars that they had right there for shipment over the field. And so similar to that Denora picture, people couldn't really see what was going on on the field. In addition, um, in Libby, leftover vermiculite was used from the mine, so the leftover vermiculite was put on gardens, playgrounds, ball fields, public spaces, high school track. Um, miners would get this dust, their stories about they would just be yellow in this dust and come home and their wives would be desperate just trying to vacuum it up, but it'd be like floating around the house. It can be used, once it's popped, it can be used um, in um, soil conditioning, it can be used in potting soil. And so people were putting it in the soil and people were then gardening in that soil and releasing the asbestos. Um, so it was just sort of blanketing the town in a variety of ways. Pollution from the mining um, and the vermiculite there has been associated with more than 400 deaths in the Libya area and thousands have fallen ill as a result of this exposure to asbestos. Um, and since these lung cancers, as I mentioned, can remain dormant for 40 years, the expectation is that more people will show up with these lung diseases that haven't yet been identified. I think this is a really interesting tie into Libby. Um, the early uses of Libby um, vermiculite was loose insulation, and you'll still find that in Libby. It was poured in the walls between, you know, walls as insulation used in attics put up there. Over 35 million homes in America may contain zonalite. Remember, that's the official um, sort of brand name of vermiculite. Zonalite insulation with asbestos in it. For almost 70 years, Libby produced much of the world's supply of vermiculite. And then in the 1960s, W.R. Grace, the company, moved from producing sort of that loose insulation into creating a spray-on insulation for high-rise construction, which boomed across the nation in the 1970s and 80s. Estimates that 300 to 400 tons of asbestos fibers were used to construct the World Trade Center. Um, historian Brett Walker, who's at MSU, states that by the 1980s, Libya asbestos was spread throughout, spread throughout the buildings and bodies um, of the nation. In fact, when the Twin Towers collapsed on September 11th, 2001, a massive cloud of smoke, dust, and debris released hundreds of, hundreds of thousands of asbestos fibers and other toxic substances into the air and blanketed New York City. Scientists found that the concentrations of asbestos dust inside Libby homes was comparable to levels found inside buildings in Lower Manhattan. According to Brett Walker, Libby vermiculite has its own history, one that follows its creation in geologic times and its movement from a small Montana town through the bodies of local residents to the steel columns of the Twin Towers and into the bodies of New Yorkers. The World Trade Center Health Registry estimates that about 410,000 people, yeah, 410,000 people were exposed to a host of toxins, including asbestos, during the rescue, recovery, and cleanup efforts that followed 9-11. Most people affected by asbestos at Ground Zero were people assigned to rescue survivors. Because of the latency of cancer from these toxins, the expectation is we will see a sharp increase in 9-11 related cancers over the next 30 years. So I think that's an interesting connection to Libby to sort of across the nation. That you see with butte and copper across the nation. So Libby is super fun, not, not as vast geographically um, as Butte, but the extreme health crisis that people were seeing in Butte really um, pushed Libby residents to seek super fun status in late 2001. And it was fairly quickly, unlike most, um, most communities, fairly quickly put on the MPL, they sort of fast tracked the super fun process and it was put on the MPL in um, 2002. 
Um, in 2009, for the first time in the history of the agency, the EPA declared a public health emergency in Libby in order to be able to fund and sort of support the cleanup of the community and the um, provide federal health care assistance for victims of asbestos-related disease. There's a center called the CARD Center, Center for Asbestos-Related um, Disease. Yes, <laughs> in Libby. Libby has eight Superfund sites. You can sort of see them, they go from Libby to Troy, basically. Um, they cover where they did a lot of the milling and processing, they do cover the mine, and then they cover the transportation routes where they were moving it to the railroad so it could connect to the railroad. Um, Early on in the Superfund process, like many toxic communities that are suffering through this, um, people were concerned about the effect of the Superfund label on tourism <coughs> dollars, but really the health issues in Libby sort of overrode that pretty quickly. Um, they really needed the government resources um, in Libby to help with the health crisis. The total cost so far has been over $600 million. WR Grace has paid about $250 million of that, but the rest has been through tax <coughs> dollars. Um, and it's not just the instance in Libby. As I said, you see that in New York, we're gonna have problems over the next coming decades. The EPA now advises all American homeowners to take extreme caution with zonal light insulation found in attics, particularly in the Midwest. There's a lot of that insulation, use insulation found in attics that they wanna warn people about. That's sort of a brief gist of Libby's story with vermiculite, asbestos, and Superfund. Um, so, looking at Superfund as a program, as I mentioned, Superfund tracks over 500,000 sites nationwide and um, focuses their super, the Superfund label, the NPL label, sorry, on about 1,700 of those sites. Um, so let's talk a little about how Superfund is taking some of these concerns now, how we should look at some of these concerns about toxic waste. So this is a map of Colorado. Um, to sort of bring it back to the beginning, which is that uh, Silverton spill, the gold cane mine spill. In Colorado, there are, t alone, there are 20 estimated, 23,000 abandoned mines. And in 2015, the Denver Post published an article that said there are about 230 um, old mines of concern leaking heavy metals laced water into Colorado's river. And the discharge from those 230 mines um, equals at least one Gold King disaster, that Yellow River disaster, every two days in Colorado, spreading cadmium, copper, lead, arsenic, manganese, zinc, and other contaminants, which has affected um, about 1,645 miles of river. So not as extreme as a yellow wall of sludge coming down a river, but across the board, their estimation is you're seeing that kind of contamination every two days in Colorado. So Silverton, I think, isn't really, well, the reason why I start with Silverton, although my research is in Montana, is because I think it's an interesting look at how a community recently has had to grapple with this idea of Superfund and how to work with the federal government. So Superfund fought, I'm oh, sorry, Silverton fought Superfund designation for 20 years. Um, they were very concerned that the stigma of being on the NPL list, of being a Superfund site, could affect the fragile tourist economy. Um, which would prevent future, and could prevent future mining. So there's a lot of concern um, for a long time in Silverton. They do not want Superfund coming in. They knew there were problems with the water. The EPA is there trying to do some remediation, but they do not want to be um, a Superfund site. They actually started an Animus River stakeholders group in 1994 as a local way to respond to the environmental damage caused by abandoned mines. And that is an interesting group to look at. It's comprised of representatives from the community, mining companies, um, landowners, environmental groups, and local, state, and federal agencies. And they did do some remediation. They've had some success um, with doing remediation on water um, and rivers in the area from mines. However, the Animus River spill, um, the scope of it, was so vast that it really revealed the limitations of local communities trying to handle these sort of environmental disasters on their own, or these environmental conditions on their own. Um, although, as I said, the spill really stoked some anti, strong anti-EPA feelings there. Um, in 2016, about eight months after the spill, Silverton and other county officials voted to ask the state of Colorado to formally request a Superfund cleanup 
of the Gold King Mine and 45 other inactive mines on the Animus River. Um, while there are concerns in Silverton that residents will be left out of the decision-making process, the scope of the program is too big and too expensive for local work um, to be effective <clears throat> on it. This is a map of Montana. Um, and across the nation, abandoned mines, to take a small example of the sort of toxic waste sites that the Superfund looks at. Superfund looks at many, you know, chemical contamination, all different things, <coughs> but I wanted to look at mining since we were talking about mining today. According to the federal government, there are as many as 500,000 abandoned mines in the nation, and abandoned mines present serious threats to human health and the environment. Um, Butte is an example of that. Libby is an example of that. Both have seen the environment and human health damage through a legacy of mining there. And you can see here, this map is not a great map, I'm sorry, but you can sort of see um, abandoned landmines in Montana alone, sort of covering from the Department of Environmental Quality. So, good historians always ask themselves, <laughs> well, none of my work's wrong. So what? So I'll <laughs> tell you what it says in those spots. Um, why does this matter? Why would anyone care about looking at this? Why is my research on this? Um, there's a number of different areas that I'm interested in looking at Superfund communities for. Um, the first, that one up top, with no words in it, should say Superfund communities as sacrificial places. Try hitting the forward button and see if it'll populate it. It just goes to the Oh, end. nope, okay. So, <laughs> so super, Superfund communities as sacrificial places. Both you and Libby um, miners helped in American industrial growth. I mean, that's just across the board. Um, can't be argued. Hard rock mining, um, copper in Butte, vermiculite in Libby, um, basically built us into industrial nation, among other areas as well. Butte copper's mines helped electrify the nation and urbanize the nation. Libby's vermiculite fireproofed the steel beams necessary for building skyscrapers in the 1970s and 80s. These materials help modernize, industrialize, and urbanize America and turn the nation into an imperial superpower. As a result of contributing to America's economic, technological, and industrial growth, both communities contend with toxic landscapes and public health concerns. So this idea of sacrificial places where communities have given so much to the growth of America and are now dealing, how do they deal with the um, ramifications of that? Um, the next one says, who, who can or should help toxic communities? And this is a real issue when you look at Superfund coming into communities, the dynamics between the government, local people, local governments, the federal government, I mean, local people, local governments. Um, many of these communities across the board, many um, Superfund communities are economically depressed. As I said, the industry has left or closed there. Some still have an industry um, working, which is a whole nother little web that you get into, particularly in the American Southeast, where you have a lot of um, communities dealing with chemical concerns or petroleum concerns from um, industry that's going on there. But um, many, as I said, are economically depressed and can't handle the scope of the problem program on their own. Silicon's a great example. It's a pretty contained area. Um, they did do some work on their own, but that Gold King spill just revealed that even through raising money for 20 years, that community was not able to handle the ramifications of industrial waste there. Um, we all are paying taxes to help fund the Superfund program now that industry's um, commitment has really died off. And then you have um, local businesses working to sort of address these issues. Montana Resources is um, working on the water from the pit. I mean, I think it's fairly clear that if it wasn't economically viable for them, that would not be their concern. They're not here to just make water better in view. They are getting that copper out of there um, to make money. But luckily, it hopefully it's working out um, for water from the pit. So where does the EPA fit into this? And how are they seen as both sort of an outside interloper, but a necessary um, component of this fight to clean up the environment? Uh, the next one with the little flyers thing there. Does technology fix our programs, problems? Does it cause our problems? I mean, I said that quote, I love that quote from that Montana Resources guy saying, oh, we've let the pits control us for 30 years. It's time we control the pit. 
That is an ongoing theme throughout industrialization and super fun, is that we can always come up with new science and technology to fix the problems that we cause. <coughs> and so how does that work out um, in communities? I mean, in Libby, for example, the asbestos is not gone. It's contained. And they're in the process of taking it off the Superfund list. It'll be off the Superfund list in 2020. But it's still in people's houses. It's still in the ground. It's in the asbestos fibers are in the trees. There's a big concern that there's a huge forest fire up there. It would release all these asbestos. They don't um, burn up, obviously. <laughs> they are fireproof, so they can float around and be released. So there's a lot of concerns of how much can um, industry, sorry, how much can technology control um, the environment. Uh, this one is the future of toxic places. Uh, I think this is a really interesting component because many places, as I said, are resistant to Superfund coming in to being designated as a Superfund site because they feel that it will harm their um, chances at tourism or their chances for return to industry. You know, mining coming back to you, or mining coming back to Libby, things like that. Um, but I think what people oftentimes don't see when they don't live in the community is the economic impact from the EPA being there. And one of the big concerns in Libby is when the EPA pulls out, all those people who have spent the past 20 years working for the EPA and getting fairly good pay, government pay for doing that, are out of work. So these communities, uh, the EPA has very big financial stakes in these communities. Um, for Anaconda, for example, the EPA has four on-site remediation and cleanup businesses, employs 60 people, and generates a million dollars in annual sales revenue. In Butte, uh, the current information says there's two on-site businesses, employs 337 people, and generates 25 million. Um, I just saw something, and Libby, I'm gonna be a little off on exactly what it was, but it was something like um, 40 or 50 million dollars in annual revenue that comes in. Comes in through workers, because logging is done there, and mining for now has not come back. And so a lot of those people, that's been their job working there. Um, and what do these towns become when and if Superfund leaves? That's what Libby's grappling with right now. Um, you have solutions to that that you can see locally. You can see Anaconda Old Works golf course built to sort of, um, built as a cap to control the stormwater contaminated with arsenic, but also to increase tourist dollars However, Old Works recently had to ask Garco for $7 million subsidy over the next 10 years to keep it open. You have up on that map that showed the Superfund site all the way down to Missoula, you have the Milltown State Park where they removed 300,000 tons of heavy metals and created a, a 600-acre state park, often called a rare environmental success story. Um, there's a great book on it called Restoring the Shining Waters. And then in Libby, you have a lot of places where they're putting in city parks. Um, at one point in the early 2000s, they created a memorial to the victims that they knew of so far and put in um, white crosses. There are about 179 white crosses for people that they knew had died from asbestos-related diseases at the time. That number, as I said, now is much higher. That did not become a permanent structure, but they did create a, a city park downtown um, that does have a memorial to the asbestos victims. So trying to navigate this process of remembering the past but also working towards the future I think is an interesting component. And finally, another area I'm interested in, this little one down here, is environmental justice and injustice. Um, some people are disproportionately exposed to and impacted by toxic environments. Um, that can be due to class, race, ethnicity, gender, a lot of different areas of that. Um, when I said earlier on that 53 million people, um, about 17% of the U.S. population, live within three miles of the Superfund site, I also mentioned that those sites tend to be economically depressed, they tend to be minority, they tend to be low income. This is across the nation, you see this tendency, and tend to be less educated um, than the rest of the U.S. population as a whole. When you include brownfield sites, which are um, sites that are the responsibility of state and tribal governments where economic development can occur until it's cleaned up from there. The percentage of the population living within three miles of contaminated sites skyrockets to 51% or 156 million people who live within three miles of a Superfund site or a brownfield site, which is also a contaminated area. Those brownfield sites are predominantly located in poor neighborhoods, um, 
predominantly occupied by minority residents, black and Hispanic residents, or on tribal lands. So there's definitely, um, you know, I, I'm interested huh, on the first one about places that are sacrificed, communities that are sacrificed, and some um, groups across the nation disproportionately bear that sacrifice based on where they lived and these Superfund sites are located. I think that's an interesting dynamic to think about. You know, you're gonna see a lot more um, impact of that if you travel to other places rather than living in Montana, for example. But um, one thing that I think is really interesting specifically about Libby is, I think similar to Butte, you have miners who worked in the mines and to some degree absorbed the sort of um, the effects of mining and said, well, there, I can make this sacrifice. You know, I know there's fires that occur in mines. Mine can be dangerous places, but I'm a miner and that's part of my job. In Libby, that was definitely the mentality of many miners. And I'm not sure that the anger would be so fierce against W.R. Grace if the miners didn't bring that dust home and their wives didn't shake out their clothes and their kids didn't play on those fields covered with vermiculite. And they're looking at stories online, that, um, in newspapers, devastating stories where families have seven kids and six of the kids have been diagnosed with lung disease already. And the father, who was the miner, is on um, oxygen knowing that that's the future for his children. Mm -hmm. So you see this impact really spread beyond people who maybe, at least in some theory, people could say, well, that's part of the risk of taking on the job. It spreads throughout communities um, to people who are um, had no sort of association with the mining industry. So those are the sort of areas. That's why I say, so what? Sorry, this slide let me down. Is, you know, I tell that. <laughs> but, and so that's where I want to sort of leave it today. And I'm happy to take any questions or any questions you guys have. Yes? I got two questions. One is 